Can you see my screen? All good? Okay. Always the usual question. Where are you? How do you feel today? Are you above the line, below the line? Uh, if you want to answer that question, I think you're going to have to put your mic off. Uh, I'm going to assume that in case uh, I don't get an answer, then it means that nobody has anything to say, and then I'll just ramble on. Yeah? Okay. Uh, a kind word will do. So much silence is deafening. Anybody want to say something really nice to me today? Love you, Vishwas. Yay! Blue looks good on you, Vishwas. <laughs> okay, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Vishwas, uh, you look good in blue. Hey, that's already taken. <laughs> already said. Find another one. I know. Oops. Oh, I was just reading about something that you had said or written where once you shaved your head bald and then you decided to keep it like that. That's an interesting thing that I found. <laughs> yes. Yes, that was true. And that was 22 okay. years ago. <laughs> man, that's a long time being bald, man. Unnaturally bald. I used to so when I was uh, when I was with uh, in that school uh, where Dolph and Olya are, I used to have um, really long hair. Don't believe it, but uh, I've still got photographs. You know, I don't believe it. It used to be that long. I used, and in those days you didn't tie it up in a ponytail. So, uh, God, those were the days. Uh, most of you weren't born then, so don't bother. Right, here we go. Anybody feeling like you're below the line and need a little help in being dragged up? You're already above the line, all of you? It's almost like a compulsory thing, right? For the next two and a half, we've got to put up with this guy. Let's get above the line really fast. Otherwise, we're going to go into a big, big, <laughs> big low <laughs> depression. <laughs> okay. Um, I think... Um, I went below the line uh, for a while, uh, for a couple of days, stuff going on in my life. And I wasn't sure that uh, I would, you know, I'd be there in, in all that spirit and the energy uh, today, but here I am and I'm really excited about uh, what we're gonna do today. And sometimes I have to just go back to uh, this question that I keep asking myself over and over again when I reach this place that why am I doing what I'm doing? And uh, and most times the answer is kind of easy. Uh, and the answer is uh, I'm doing it because I love doing it. And, uh, and then I, and, and it's almost instant. Even coffee isn't that instant anymore. But this, this energizing and saying, okay, now I know why I'm doing this and I got to be there 100% because uh, there's a whole bunch of people out there who are 100% there. So here I am, above the line and uh, waiting for, for you to get there. Today's topic is... Spaces. This, this issue of when we work with groups, too often we tend to look at them as groups, and groups are a bunch of people and they come with their own dreams and aspirations and desires. Uh, many of them are there because they've been told to be there. And uh, you don't really have their attention till, uh, till we choose to do something different. <clears throat> Some groups 
hang in there. And if they're, if they're on a two hour, four hour, uh, in the corporate world, there are such things as uh, two hour and four hour sessions. And uh, they're live, and they're always telling you that um, in those four hours, as a trainer, you're supposed to change their lives. And it's also always a question, how, how am I going to do this? And I've never found myself uh, telling myself that, no, I can't do it. Uh, I always get into this space where I'm trying to say, okay, what can I do to make that happen? And uh, uh, I think the only difference between what I'm trying to do and, uh, is that I'm not trying to get anybody anywhere. Uh, I have no intended outcome for the group. I have great intentions uh, with content and context and stories and their, their lives while uh, they connect with uh, with us as educators out there. But uh, regardless of whether it's a two hour training or a whole year, an academic year with children, um, I've always kept myself away from this place of wanting to take them somewhere defined by me. And at this point in time, I'm just going to refer to it as open to outcome. Um, because everything that we do affects people in very different ways. And there's no way you can get everybody to the same place. And if that's true, then the question is, OK, uh, more important is finding out uh, where people want to go. And if we want to find out where people want to go, then we have to do something very, very specific in the context of building a sense of belonging. And I'm just, at this point in time, going to call it um, community. That it's a bunch of people that are coming together with a common purpose. It doesn't make it a team. The definition is similar, but a community is, uh, at least there is a stated uh, purpose, and it could be, okay, we're all in fifth grade, and therefore we are a class in one classroom. Uh, even, if, um, even if it's a bunch of people coming together for, uh, adults coming together for a leadership program out in the uh, woods, um, this, they still become that community for that period of time and it becomes critical that we treat them as a community, not a bunch of individuals. Now, what does that really mean? So um, very clearly, uh, we are a community right now. We've got this common purpose. There's a reason why we are here together. But that's the larger picture. Let's go dive a little deeper into what, uh, uh, what it means to create a sense of community within uh, the spaces that we are in. The other piece is that uh, while the whole group may come together with different objectives in mind, for that period of time that we are together, somewhere we have to define for ourselves what our purpose is. Even if you work with a bunch of adults, you will find that they don't know why they are there. And one of the hardest things, uh, even on a corporate training program where people have been sent, uh, or a teacher training program where people have been sent, it's just called either a team building program or a leadership program or a teacher training program. And that doesn't really say anything at all. So it's very critical that within the time that we have with them, some time must be spent in building the sense of purpose for the group. Now, sometimes we define it as educators, and most times it's great for them to define. I've had numerous occasions when I have uh, I've gone on a training program and the organization said, this is why we are there. 
and the leadership in the organization shared a different agenda with the group. Uh, and their reason was that if I don't tell them that there is recreation and fun uh, and so on and so forth, they won't attend it. They will find excuses not to be there. But when you have something like that happening and you work at cross purposes, um, then you can, I've had mutiny on my program. Because they were told a certain thing and I, and I just assumed that they knew about it. And this was kind of early in my experience as uh, an outdoor adventure educator. And we went out there and ha halfway through day one on a three day program, uh, half of them disappeared. And they just disappeared. So I said, okay, what have I got? I've got half the group and they seem interested. I'm going to stay with them. So I stayed with them. And in the evening, um, suddenly I was, what's the English word for Gheraud? <laughs> Anybody? Surrounded. Surrounded. No, surrounded. Yeah, surrounded. but you know what? It's like surrounded by angry young people who said, we don't want to do this, this gaming and this uh, laughter and this fun stuff. We don't want to do it. So I went up Corner. to Connor. Oh, okay. Yeah, more, it, it, I felt like that. So I quickly went to the leadership and I said, uh, please explain to me what's going on. What have you told them? And he said, um, if I told them that, they, uh, they, that you were on a training program, half of them wouldn't turn up. I said, great, so are you going to resolve this or am I going to resolve this? And he said, I need your help. I said, okay, here's my help. So I went back to the group and I said, um, so what's your plan for the day? And they said, oh, we want, to, uh, we want to party and get drunk tonight. We were at a resort in the middle of the mountains somewhere in Rishikesh. And uh, so I said, okay, but here's the condition. If you drink tonight, you don't get to do adventure stuff tomorrow. And they didn't know what I was talking about. So they, sure enough, they got drunk and they partied and they were, and uh, the agreement with them the previous evening was um, that we would all be there for breakfast and then we would have a chat. So they trickled in around nine o'clock in the morning. And I said, oh, okay, this, this looks like, uh, I've got a full-blooded mutiny out here. And uh, so we talked, we gathered after breakfast at about 9.30, it just went on and on. And then I said, okay, we're just gonna take a walk. And those of you who've been to Rishikesh, beautiful place, there's this, uh, this uh, wonderful bridge called the Lakshman Jula. And under the Lakshman Jula, that bridge, it's a whole bunch of beautiful rocks on the banks of the river. It was a beautiful day. We sat down on the rocks and uh, I took it to them. I said, you told me you wanted to do adventure. You got drunk. No adventure today. Now, do you know why you are here? We had this long conversation that went on for three hours. Now, you got to remember that this is a bunch of uh, corporate folks. Young, young, but um, in a, working with a very uh, well-known organization. And there was this big gap between what uh, the leadership wanted and what the people wanted. Cutting the big story short, I realized, and I, you got to remember, this was at a time in my life when I had not read enough about you know, all the stuff I'm throwing at you today. And um, I just had to work on gut feel. And I, I said, look, my invoice is going to be paid. The only difference is, do you want to, and if you tell me you don't want to do anything, I'm cool with it. But I'm not the decision maker here. I have come here with a very, uh, with a very specific role in mind. I need you to tell your leadership standing here that that's what you want to do. And if you are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. 
And I told the, uh, the uh, team lead, I said, uh, you know what our deal is? And uh, I think he, uh, at that point in time, he had to step up and he did. And he said, look, as a team, we are a mess. And he put it out to them. The conversation went, just got better and better and better. At the end of uh, those three hours pre-lunch, we had such a fantastic agreement about what, uh, what their role was going to be and what my role was going to be. And the way uh, it turned out was that they would get their adventure. They would get their rock climbing, their rappelling, their uh, uh, kayaking in the Ganga. Uh, they would get their camp out. They would get everything on the condition that they were willing to sit back and have a chat about it at the end of every activity and do the reflective piece. You know, uh, but why did I tell you the story? Sometimes you don't have much time to build community. And we've got to do it in the most honest and open book way that we can find. I believe that the only reason I was able to do that on that day was because um, I wasn't attached to anything. I was there with my team and I, I was there to do a job. It was not my job to take that team to a better performance. It was to create an opportunity. And this is how we tend to see ourselves we think we are change makers and the only our job is to bring about change in people it isn't our job is to create the space that can enable people within that space to uh, to do what they want for themselves so hidden within this developing the classroom as a community is the fact that You've got a whole bunch of small groups and cliques. So every team, every group has uh, subgroups and cliques. You know that, right? Very often that's seen as a not a good thing. And here's my proposal. We covered it last time. That is their safe space. If we, we can disrupt it, because we want to create this equilibrium. So great opportunity there. The, every time I see subgroups, I say, yeah, great opportunity to break that thing and create some disequilibrium for them. So it's so easy to do it. All I need to do is to create a scenario in which um, their closest friend is not with them. So this is a cheap trick, but I'll give it to you. You ready? <laughs> If you find, if one of the issues with your group is that there's a whole bunch of subgroups, line them up and say, go and stand to your best friend. Okay? And then if you're making, if you're going to make your own groups for small or for other activities or whatever, uh, then you say, okay, count one, two, one, two, whatever. And you have it. And this is what I have found, that um, they're just telling me at that point in time that I don't feel safe enough with you. But if I can get playful quickly, and, pl and this is the power of play, unfortunately, we're not getting an opportunity to, ex to experience that. But uh, those who have done deep will know that um, the first session in deep is always scary because I, uh, that's my, you know, uh, hit out at you and your thinking and the way uh, you look at life kind of session. Day two gets a little better because uh, they realize I'm not so scary. But day, uh, session three, when we go out into the outdoors, changes everything. Because then the element of play comes alive for everybody and they say, wow, this is a great place to hang out. So uh, if, if, if we can all learn those skills of being able to create a sense of play as soon as possible, 
I can assure you that the experience for you and your students will be a lot better. Okay, so this it's okay for people to be in small groups and subgroups and cliques because that is their safe space. And we talked about we we've talked a little about how our intention in whatever time we have is to create safe spaces. But the overall intention eventually is really people, individuals, people who want to take something back. And eventually a team is a bunch of individuals. And if we can, there is no, you know, there's this romantic notion of a we. There is certainly a place for the we. But there's certainly a big place for the I. I cannot be a part of a team if I am feeling insecure. If the team, if being with a team makes me insecure and makes me feel unsafe, then it's never going to be a team. It's going to be a bunch of individuals delivering something on a particular date for a particular organization. And you know what? The job will always get done. Okay, just remember this. The job will always get done. If you encounter a scenario when the job does not get done, and we might be talking about this a little later on the course, it's what we call a dysfunctional team. And in a dysfunctional team, the team isn't dysfunctional. It's a couple of individuals invariably who influence dysfunctionality. So, it's a bunch of individuals, and if we can, uh, the, the beauty of any program is being able to offer everybody at least something in every session that we conduct. We saw that through the learning styles inventory. So if we can get better at doing more things, then we will be able to engage more people more of the time, okay? So we're gonna be looking at the at uh, those two worlds of the educator. Great. Oh, I have a question for you. I want you to look at these pictures. Okay. So get into your annotator and in that part of the screen, uh, is is he is he on the right side of your screen? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> That's left. Okay. This is right. <laughs> right. Okay. Got it. On that side of the screen, please write down words that describe what you see. You should have been typing on that side of the line. <laughs> just, just for those excited, engaged, wanting to join in, joyous people. <laughs> see if you can move it. If you hover your mouse over that, you'd see a cross wire. Just move those words. Uh, when I'm typing, nothing is coming on the screen. You have to go to the annotator oh. and text. Then you need new glasses. No, the annotator is not coming. <laughs> Top of the screen. Yeah. You see that bar? Meeting information. You are using enhanced encryption. It says mute, stop video, security, participants, all that stuff. Oh. Not coming. I, I've got only the video. Ah, yeah. Hmm. Yay. Okay. So what do I do? Where do I go? You go to annotator. There is no annotator. Annotation. No, there is no annotation also. 
when on top you see a green bar right it says you are viewing vishwas patre's screen yeah huh? and next to that there's view options okay so click Got on that drop down and then there's annotate okay okay fine Got it? Yeah. Now, what do i do i just click on text click yeah. on text and then oh. click on the side i got that huh? yeah <coughs> yes okay also, only you won't be able to move those words uh, only i want. can do that yeah okay i'm going to risk it <laughs> then i'm as bad as you man don't worry uh Okay, select. Now I'm just thinking if I could. Uh... Select all of them, and you know. Okay, so uh, while I'm doing this, I'm going to show you another picture, and I'd like you to uh, use words that. Describe the other character. Okay. Give me ten seconds. I think I'm getting better at this. Okay. So this time. uh uh see if you can use a different uh, is uh, can you change the color of your text che you want to tell them how to do that yeah um so you just there's a format thing out there if you click on format you can pick whatever color you want and choose change the color. the color so choose red maybe red okay Okay. What do we write again, Vishal? Um, coming up. What do you see? Hmm. Okay, we got to get a grab of the screen, huh? This is really brilliant. Okay, all those blue ones. Thank you again. Okay, God, you got a lot of words. Oh, stop! Thank you. <laughs> so here's a question. Jay, you got that? So, um, Kya bola? Is that is that the expression of that person? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. uh right i mean there's the uh, the moment i've introduced that environment in that space does it change anything for you you think no no for those of you who uh, where you think it changes anything uh, just uh, again type words if you want to change your word but not compulsory i just want to check oh oh okay so now she's focused Instead of grumpy and all those words, she's now focused. Interesting. And the arrow means uh... okay. You're playing with <laughs> okay. Okay, great. So somewhere there's a change, right? Okay, 
Next question. Do you think they're learning anything? Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. Do you think they're learning anything? Open to yes. conversation. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Both of them are learning. Yes. Yes, they yeah. are. Yeah. Do you have students There's like that? Do One is students? learning by doing and learning by observing. Learning by observing. Oh, yeah. Baat hai. Kya learning. Baat. So we know that, right? And yet, for some reason, our treatment meted out to these these kind of uh, students is different. You know what I'm talking about, right? Very often, okay, whom would you give your attention to? Uh, be as honest as you can. Put a star or a heart on the side that uh, of that line. If you saw two students like this in your class, where would you give the attention? Where would your attention grow? Whom would you give attention to? Okay, let's just make an assumption that the girl has more uh, stars. Uh, what would you say to them? Learn from the mistake of other. You don't have time to do all the, to do I all the mistakes. Yourself. I would be curious. I would, what would be curious to know what uh what did she see what did she observe okay is there anything that she has she has reflected upon so remember you got only a 40 minute class huh yeah we think of the questions and our specific ones so maybe what is she seeing and observing what okay she, what would she do differently if she was doing this? you made an assumption already there right but I feel the attention would go to both and not just one person because, I mean, both of them are part of the class equally. Oh. Both of them are learning. Oh, you, really? You're one of those democratic types, huh? <laughs> Everybody's equal. Do you think these people are equal? Maybe there's a game that is going on that requires one person to uh, work and the other person to observe and then maybe it switches after some point of time. I mean, it's an assumption, but I'm sure that both of them are part of the class because if we see both of them are wearing the same kind of shirt, so maybe it represents some kind of uniformity out here. <laughs> this thing, wonderful coincidences. Okay, cool. So here's what I want to do with this. <clears throat> Thank you so much for to all of you for putting your hearts and stars somewhere. Okay. So here's the thing about the methodology that we use and when we are uh, when we're looking at our students i think there's something we need to remember and we've discovered that through uh, the last session when we did the learning styles inventory that you could very well so uh, don't take my word for it but the, le the the girl is a classic assimilator and the boy is a classic accommodator action doing and the other one's thinking and um, just to remember that and to remember that in anything that, that as educated so here's where we need to change the way we look at our classroom it's not so much uh, where shall i pay my attention what shall i do with them but um, what am i going to do with uh, these different kinds of learners and to remember that throughout the experiential learning process these are the things that are going on. And you and many of you put those words out there, right? She looks curious. You guys are solving a problem. Serious one. Okay? Just remember this.
Okay, so what is this space that we find ourselves in? This is the educator's world. I'm going to go a little fast with this. Stay with me. And the only time you really must stop me is if you do not understand or if it conf if something confuses you completely. Okay, so uh, we've used the word facilitator, but just remember that uh, we're talking about uh, the educator. That's the educator and that's the participant and that participant might be an adult, a youth, a child, could be anybody, could be somebody at home, could be our own children, it could be anybody that we are talking to and having a conversation with about anything. So just remember that, that uh, all of us are here for different reasons. For some of us, this is, we're gonna go and apply it, uh, apply it in the outdoors. Some of us back in classroom, some of us back in the family. Um, and some of us, I don't know where you can apply this, but the truth is this, this principle can be applied everywhere all the time in any scenario which in, where you are connected to people. Okay, great. This is the educator's world. How do you, how do you receive your world? It's a question. Uh, Vishwas, could you just raise your uh, pictures? Uh, uh, thank you. How do you receive your world? It's monsoon. Imagine your senses. Huh? Your senses. Your senses, please name them. Sight, sound, uh, tactile sense, smell, and taste. Okay. So we've been told there are only five senses, right? By and large. Hmm. Okay. What's the sixth sense? Feeling. Thoughts based on intuition. 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 I heard the right answer. <laughs> intuition. When when you can't make sense of the world with those five, what do you reach out to? Gut feeling. Gut. Gut feeling. Do you know why? Yeah. Do you know experience. Why? Yeah, experience. Gut feel. What is gut, why gut feel? Why is it called the gut feel? Any idea? Because next to the brain, the gut, this stomach portion, has the largest number of receptors. Okay? So when you can't feel it through your five senses and you can't explain it, you we call it the gut feel. I have a gut feeling about this. Intuition if you want to call it that. Okay, so uh, maybe we need to read up more. Now, I want you to tell, I'm, we're going to do a little activity just to get a sense of this. Are you ready? I'm not going to be watching, but you're going to close your eyes. Now do this. Either hand is okay. Okay. So you'll have to keep your eyes open to see what I'm doing first. Now close your eyes and touch your elbow. Okay. Show me on screen. Oh, are you sure that's your elbow? And you all, you can open your eyes now. You can check whether it's your elbow. Is it your elbow? Okay, hopefully, great. Did you get it right? You weren't looking. Which sense is that? You didn't search. You didn't go, oh, I'm going to walk down my hand with my finger and then go down there. You didn't do that. You just went straight there, yes? Yes. How do you explain that? Vishwas, it's also muscle memory. Muscle memory? Right? <laughs> yes. Okay. There's a whole muscle memory. Which muscle remembers what? Okay, we won't go there yet. The answer is it's not muscle memory. There's a new brain body thing that says. You went on mute, Vishwas. You muted yourself.
Somebody doesn't like me. Okay, try another one. You ready? Try the other finger. Which uh, one? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, the other yes, finger. Ready? Close your eyes. Close your eyes and touch the tip of your nose. Stay there. It's stuck. Don't move it. Open your eyes. Look at the screen. Does everybody have the nose? Sharon? Yes. You lost your finger or lost your nose? No, I lost my internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 So you've got your nose. Where did that come from? What I'd like you to do is do a little study about the senses. There are, they found 21 different ones. Okay, but you're right. We receive the world through the senses. So it makes sense that when you walk into a room where you are teaching, you're educating, it makes sense that the moment you walk in, your group, is respond, their first response is going to be through the senses. Yes, no, maybe. Cool. So this is what we call the sensory world. Uh, Dos. You there? Yeah. So uh, today I'm going to answer the questions that you asked. Uh, may not be completely, but here's a way of looking at it. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to club things as we go along here because uh, this is not just, I'm not just giving you some gyan. I'm giving you uh, an opportunity to look at what we do in a different way and therefore uh, change the way we practice. Okay, so if, if it's true that um, that first impression is important, uh, you know, TED Talks, if you, uh, if you read all that material, watch those videos, they tell you that in the first 10 seconds, you got to do something. You got to get their attention. Why? Because you got to keep their attention for the next 20 minutes. So it makes sense that in any classroom, any scenario, so where we walk in and we want their attention, that we have to be conscious of the fact that we're going to, that they're going to be receiving you through the senses. Therefore, how, what do, how does that change the way we look at what we do? When we design what we're going to do, ask yourself the question, how will learners receive the experience? So the assumption here is that you're going to be creating an experience. Okay, an experience of of uh, um, teaching botany for 40 minutes. What would be an exciting way to grab their attention and get them, uh, get their senses in the direction that you want in the first 10 seconds? What might, what might be a way? Let's say, assume you're teaching botany. Any thoughts? This is what I, this is what I did. Uh, I walked into the classroom. Now you got to remember that in boarding schools, uh, you have uh, you. It's a school where you do have male teachers, but not that many. In any school, there are hardly any male teachers. So I was already a novelty. So I walked in with flowers, you know, in my. I had hair then. I put flowers in my hair and walked in. And there was pin drop silence. Now, you might say this is tomfoolery. Oh, that's a very British word, by the way. You know, it was, uh, it was a stupid thing to do that I'm just <clears throat> getting their attention. You're absolutely right. But I got that conversation going within the first 10 seconds. And they knew what the class was going to be about. Yeah, so there is always this element of surprise that is really helpful. Yeah. So this is this could be it. So yeah. some people call it surprise. 
but uh, you can surprise them in many different ways. But what essentially you're doing, even when you surprise people, is appealing to their senses. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, you play with their expectations. Like this, you do something unexpected. That's one way of doing it. You could even do something expected, but in a different way. And you still grab their attention. I agree with Dolph. We call it in our school, we call it a hook or, a, you know, something that grabs their attention at the first go. So um, we were teaching science. Uh, we started with something in forces and we started, you know, we went with a lab coat in our classroom and grabbed their attention out there. Uh, when we're doing solar system, we dressed up like an alien and went okay. there and talked about it. So are you talking about similar hooks? Yeah. Call it a hook, call it a surprise, call it whatever. My question is why? Why, <laughs> why does all that theory around uh, excitement in a classroom of getting your audience to pay attention, why? Because okay, our gonna... brain is, is structured that way that it uh, pays attention more to the new information than the, to the information that we knew before. What it does that new information do? It releases the dopamine. It, it's the reward for learning something new. Um, if they do something. But here, I am as a, as a teacher, I'm doing the thing when you are uh, suffering my antics. I think for me in my classroom, my learners are more excited to see ah. something new. To okay, stop, 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 that... stop, 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 stop. What is the word you used? See something new, feel something new. Um, I mean, I can think of many experiences that we have okay. had. Okay, you used a very interesting word. Felt, touched, you know, uh, when we were doing senses, we, we took all kinds of things in our classroom, you know, got them fruits and vegetables that they could touch and smell and feel. And it took us to another level. Don't run away with this. All right. <laughs> You're using words and the answer is in your narrative. I think it's excitement. Excited. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's just get a little technical here. Okay. What you're really appealing to is uh, something called feeling. You hear that word? You want them to feel something. Yes or no? Yes. That's the primary intention, right? That's true. And sometimes we, we call it, we want them to feel good. Okay, cool, you can call it that. But that's part of the inner world. And the reason I say that is that if you have a class full of, uh, let's say 30 children, not everybody is gonna feel the same thing. True? They're all gonna be feeling different things. You may get their attention. I mean, all you need is a firecracker and you, and, uh, you can get them feeling something. And it might be the same thing on, for that moment, but after that, that feeling can change. So what we are really appealing to with that hook, with that different thing that we do, attention getting thing, is the inner world. Now here's, here's, what, uh, here's the inner world. What we want them to do is engage emotionally. So, the other question we can ask ourselves, I said as educators, ask us, we need to ask ourselves, how will learners receive the experience? So the facilitator or the educator's question is in that bottom line there. How will they engage emotionally with what I'm going to do with them? Okay, now. How I feel is how I'm going to learn. Okay, so here's a question for you. Che, you ready? Here's a whole bunch of words. Uh, Chetan's going to send you a, uh, a URL on Slack and in the chat. Click on it and type in which whatever words. And if they're not there, that's fine. You can use your own words. But I, what I'd like you to do 
is to i'm just giving you a language here okay use any of these words or uh, any that you want and type in how you are feeling How are you feeling right now? Ashwas, you still want the words to show? Yeah. Oh, okay. no. Uh, yeah, choose a word because then we'll put it off in uh, 10 seconds. So write it down if you want. No, right now uh, the sharing stopped. I'll share. Okay. Uh, do I need to do anything? No, I'll do it. Okay. You can use more than one if you want. Are we doing the word cloud? <clears throat> Are you going to put it up? Okay, so at this point in time, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, what the biggest words are? The biggest word uh, most people have used is curious, which is great for a learning environment. Excited, engaged, inspired, confused. Okay. Uh, engaged, interested, peaceful, skeptic. Oh, okay. Now, how you feel right now is so. Can I take the screen back? Yeah. So, how you feel is going to affect how you learn. And here's my proposal if there's anybody who feels like you want to say something, ask something, and get something out of the way, please feel free to do that now. I'll spend a few minutes. So uh, maybe we can get back to that place where uh, the receiving continues to happen, if you want. If you don't want, that's fine too. Anybody? Confusion can also be a, an interim state. It's like um, you're going on a train journey and the train stops at a station. And you wonder why, why is it stopped? And there's a question mark for a while. And then when it moves again, you say, ah, okay. So we are on the journey again. And that's fine. That doesn't, in my opinion, um, I love that state. And if somebody tells me they're confused and I say, wonderful, you're in the right place. But if it's preventing you from being able to listen or to hear, then do let me know. Anything that might be preventing you from uh, being in that learning space, bring it up now if you want. Okay? Anybody? Uh, no. Yes. yes uh, when you ask us to do these things, by the time I really work my way out, mm -hmm. uh, the screen has disappeared. So I'm not able to participate then. Okay. So here's an opportunity. Next time you just uh, put your microphone on and say, here are my words. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. 
Vishwas, uh, yes. I would like to say something. Yes. So, uh, like, um, when you ask something, and uh, you know, I, I, I like, a, I'm a person who thinks a lot before saying something. So by the time, like, how Zen has been feeling in terms of you know uh, writing something over the screen or something, I kind of take a lot of time to think and say and by the time I am about to say you you know probably get on to the next question and the second thing is that um, uh, I constantly think that you know uh, how can I use all this during I mean in my context like because uh, I wrote that in, one, in the journal also because you use a lot of terms like teacher student you know here we have a lot of educators, but I'm not in that education field. Uh, I don't work with children. Whom do you so work with? Ha, uh, I, I work with the government. So I work with... Are you part of a team? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I know, but, uh, but still there are, you know, things that... Uh, I feel, okay, how can I use this in my context? Right. So and I'm constantly trying to uh, play this game of, okay, if you are this, if you are that. And every one of these principles can be applied in our personal relationships. Uh, and what I'm really saying here is personal relationships doesn't necessarily always mean family. It can be, you could be part of a team. You could be leading a team, right? Uh, you, uh, even when you're dealing with your boss, all this is applicable. He's sensing you before he listens to you. So next time go to a dance in the door, at the door before you run in and see what happens. No, I'm just joking, but you know. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, see if you can constantly pull it into your environment and say, okay, what could I do? Yeah? And just remember, the answer is <laughs> answers will come in time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. But uh, would it help if I made it a point to just check in with you? If I feel I'm going too fast, say, Sharon, do you have anything to ask? Quickly tell me, otherwise I'm going to move ahead. <laughs> if it, can I stress you out a little? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll try and remember that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, can I move on now? I have one right. short request. Yeah, okay. Hi, this is Natalia. Um, so I realized that a lot of people in this call are from India. Yeah. And sometimes you switch to Hindi, naturally, because that's, that's the habit. But there are a couple of us here, I mean, at least one of us, me, who doesn't speak Hindi. And every right. time Hindi is used, I switch out, like I switch off, because my, my brain does not process it. And I would request to keep it to English if it's possible. Right. So do me a favor. Uh, hit me on the head when I do it next. Because I, uh, the reason I say this is I am, I'm trying to be really, really conscious of that. Uh, there's other people from other parts of the world as well. And if I'm doing it, I might use certain colloquialisms, which you don't really need to even understand. Sometimes that comes naturally. But if I'm trying to explain something, I can assure you one thing, I can't think in Hindi or, or the colloquial language or the local language. I was brought up with English. So if I've said something, then just laugh. Okay? <laughs> so, because I'm not saying anything it's important not, at that point in time. Yeah, I realize that it's not something important. I'm saying that my brain is working this way. Okay. It just switches off the tumbler because like, Okay, we're not understanding this, and and that's it. My 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 thought process has gone. Silent. Got it. So when you walk away, I know I've used something terrible. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll remember that. Done. So I'm going to move on. So here we go. Um, feeling is a critical piece. How people feel is how they're going to learn, right? So let's get back to what else that inner world is. So you've got uh, you've got feelings. Then you got thinking. Okay. And the question edu as educators we want to ask is. Vishwas, you'll have to share your screen again. 
Oops. Okay. You mean I haven't done that? God, there's so much to share, man. Is this better? Yeah? Okay. All right. So uh, we've got feelings, then we've got thinking. And I'm just converting that to when we talk about, so most of us, uh, when we walk into a classroom session, we're going there to deliver content. We're asking them, we're wanting them to think about stuff, right? So it makes sense if we ask ourselves, what do I want them to know? So what do I want them to feel? What do I want them to think? And the aspirations of everybody is this whole act of becoming something else. And that's true for every one of you on the screen. That you are on this course because you want to become, you've got this aspiration. You want to be a different educator, better educator, a wiser educator, a more practitioner or practice oriented educator, whatever your words might be. And that inner world that as educators we are trying to influence is their sense of being. And this whole game of change that we discussed in the first session is part of this inner world, okay? How they feel, what they think, and their world, in a world of being and becoming, is an area that we have no control over whatsoever. You see, the problem with a lot of us as educators is we are trying to change exactly that place. We want to change who they are. We want them to become, we, we're setting the standards and we're saying, you have to be a 35% student if, uh, if you have to pass in a particular subject, but life is not subject. Now, how do I then, as an educator, if, I'm, if my outcome is gonna be measured by that, how am I gonna see that person as, as a person who, as a student, as a child, as an, whoever it might be, who is in a phase of development. I'm going to call it work in progress. Just because they didn't get 35%, does that mean that they are not, they're not worth anything in this world? I, uh, I'm going to share a little story. I was an extremely shy child till I was in the eighth grade, seventh grade. Then in the eighth grade, uh, they sent me off to a school in England. And I spent a year and a half, almost two years there. And I came back with long hair, an accent that apparently has not left me. And I didn't really study anything there. Because that school was more a commune. We've got two teachers here who know what I'm talking about. People come with their own mindsets and uh, wanting to do their own thing and they want to do it at their own. It's one of those uh, places where students have the freedom to do it at their own pace. And I'm talking of way back in 1971. This is, uh, if any of you know anything about rock, pop, music, Western music, it was post, um, what was that festival, music festival? Che? Talk. Post Woodstock. Thank you. So long hair. Oh God, it was wild. Anyway, I went there. I came back to the school I was in. And of course, I failed in every subject. And I didn't, at that point in time, we didn't, I wasn't measured on the basis of percentage. It was grade. 
I still have that report with me. Every teacher of mine said, I, had, I got E and F. You know, there's alphabets, A, B, C, D, E, F. And F, you're gone, you <laughs> means you failed. Every subject, I got E and F. But you know what? When I came back, I won the school, I became the school tennis champ. I became the school table tennis champ. The principal loved sportsmen. He loved sports. And there's this last page of that report which says, uh, send him into the next class. I think he will be fine. I think that. I think that saved my life. I'm wondering what might have happened if they had collected. And I tell you what, uh, in today's world, if this happened, there was no chance I would be sent to the next class. I would probably be held back by the, for the next two years. OK, to cut a long story short, I got a first class, I did damn well. You buy my own standards, okay? And what changed everything was that inner world that we're talking about here. How I felt, who I wanted to be, all that was hooked into my performance. And because they did not, they could not control it. And they, in fact, through the decisions that they made, they supported my internal state. I live to tell the tale. The problem with the current education system, by and large, is that we are trying to control a lot of that inner stuff. Not just as educators, but as parents as well, not just class teachers or whatever, as parents as well. Sharon, in your context, you want your boss to sign off on that thing, that work you've done, right? Regardless of whether you've done a good job or not, you have an expectation? Yes? Yes. That's his inner world. You've got no control. Even if you do a dance. Okay, we need to understand this. So then what do we really have control over? This is where we do have control. We've got control over the outer world. And the outer world is the learning environment and the stuff that we do. The environment, the, the biggest piece in the learning environment is you and me. Who do we bring into that classroom? Are we our angry, dissatisfied selves? Or do we bring joy into that space the moment we walk in? Do we bring a sense of safety? Do we bring a sense of uh, being non-judgmental? Do we bring laughter? Do we bring acceptance? You are a big part of that world. And just remember, don't ever think that, you know what, um, a lot of teachers come to this place where they say, I can't do anything to the inner world anyway, so I'm going to retire from trying to do anything. And that despondency, that sadness about knowing that you can't control the inner world can make you bring that sadness and helplessness into that space. I'm saying, hey, you know what? Let's accept this fact that we have no control over that and let's, let's just get, let it go, no? We have no control. And this is true with our children as well. Please remember this. We want them to eat green vegetables. Forget it. If you wrap, potentially, if you wrap green vegetables in a pizza, they're more likely to do it. And somewhere, these two worlds of, you know, their world and our world has to come to this wonderful 
place of harmony. And, and I don't know how to do that, but I can tell you this. Creating a safe environment for them to be able to express themselves is a big one in them being able to make the choices that matter to them. They have no control over their choices anyway. Okay. So, when we walk into that classroom, let's remember these questions. Whatever I'm going to do, how are they likely to receive that experience? What am I going to do to affect the way they feel about where they are? What do I want them to know at the end of whatever session I'm doing with them? What do I want them to think about at the end of what I'm doing with them? So I'm separating these two things, thinking and knowing. Okay? How am I going to discover or how am I going to help them uh, look at what they want to be and become? Then in the world that we have control over, the questions we want to ask is, what is the environment in and how can I make it more conducive to the learning process? What will they actually do? And th that's all the logistics stuff, you know? Are we going to throw a ball? Are we going to throw a chicken? You know, oh, sorry, rubber chicken. <laughs> we don't throw chickens in the classroom, but <clears throat> in the West, they have this thing called the rubber chicken and it's a wonderful toy that they throw around. What am, I going to, what, am, what am I going to throw? What tools am I going to use? What toys am I going to use to make that space exciting? Before we move on. Vishwas, could I ask a question? You could. Um, I was wondering, because yeah, like all these questions, they do make sense, but um, have you got an example of, of like a teacher that asked himself or herself these questions and then implemented it in a certain way? Because yeah. the example would make it more alive. Like maybe just have something to read that you can upload. Can I tell you a story? <laughs> if you don't say to cut a long story short. Okay. So here's the long story. Uh, institutions don't like me bring these crazy ideas but there was an institution that agreed and we went back and forth on this and it was one of the most exciting journeys even <clears throat> the agreement because um, I said hey look you know what let's do some experiential stuff let's have an experiential classroom and they said uh, what does it look like and I said well, those, those children are going to see only two teachers through the entire year. Those two teachers will teach them everything that they need to know through the year. And this was, I think, uh, uh, sixth grade. Then the school said, hey, but uh, you have to. So here's the deal. Okay, we will, do, we will give you that. But here's the deal. You have to submit. Uh, you have to enter marks into that, that roster, that sheet. And you have to submit uh, monthly tests, test performance, uh, half yearly test performance, and final exam performance. I said, agreed. Condition. My question may paper my correction methodology. It turned out okay. Here's what we did. Now, and it was the most exciting three months that I've ever had in the context of education or teaching children classrooms. Uh, so uh, in India, the academic year begins in June. We started work in April. And what we did was this, we took 
all the textbooks that they wanted, the, all the stuff, the contents that they wanted those children to know. Now, I'm going to tell you the story because I'm going to share how it was eventually done uh, a little later, uh, probably the seventh session or so. I'm just going to give you the story now. Um, so we had that classroom. Now, this was the age where they moved from sitting on the floor to sitting on benches and tables. And it was, you know, it's that age, sixth grade, they're kind of growing up. Uh, it was it was that initial graduation from floor to table and chair. This was the opening piece, day one, June 15th or 16th it was. We threw away all the furniture. The children came with their bags of new uh, books, and new uniforms. And uh, they came to what was supposed to be their classroom and they found no furniture. What they did see, now here's the thing, there were the only male teachers in that school were two bearded gentlemen. Okay, and these two gentlemen were sitting in two corners of the room. And as the children walked into an empty space, They, they, they wouldn't walk in, they just stood at the door. Now, uh, door, the context here is creating that space. Okay? Uh, we're trying to create the space. We're trying to create a space where we're trying to send a message to them on day one, and we're beginning it with that sensory world. So these two guys have music instruments, and they're playing a rhythm. And then the other teacher jumps and, and we're paying no attention to the children at all. I mean, it's like they don't exist. We're just doing our own thing. So this begins. What we've thrown on the floor is a whole bunch of noisemakers. We don't say a word. They walk into that classroom. And over the period of about 10, uh, first 10 minutes, they wouldn't walk in. For the next one hour, we had a jam session going on, not one word spoken. In some ways, that opening piece was a metaphor for what we were trying to say. What we were trying to say was this, that how you feel is critical to what's gonna happen in this classroom. Each of you brings a different instrument. That instrument is who you are, that inner being, what you want to become, and what you want to belong to. The whole picture of, and, and you'll, you'll find this entire, what you're seeing on screen right now, is what we did in that first hour of that first day. What eventually emerged was a process in which they ran the classroom themselves, they decided what they wanted to learn, they found resources for what they wanted to learn, they taught each other, we just became guides. When they, when, uh, they had a subject called civics, when they learn about governments and how governments are organized and so on. And the classroom, they organized their classroom as a government that they wanted. And they would read newspapers and they would do all that and they would, you know, bring that information and say, we don't want to be like that. So then what's the solution? So we will do it through dialogue. So they spend hours and, and this is the magic of it. The first four months, I had told school, I will give you your marks and all that and you can choose to believe it or not, but don't ask me for performance. And we spent the first four months building community. We were establishing relationships. How will people talk to each other? How will we resolve conflict? How will we learn? How will we eat? How will we, um, how will we dress? How will we, you know, all that, that, that's so, such a big part of living. And it was just magic. 
which is incredible what happened because they took, took away the content from us. Assessment was another piece. I was, uh, well, had a lot of fun with it. Doss, does that answer your question? Yeah, I get more of an idea. Yeah, I'm also thinking about my, my own classes and yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, just remember, walk in with joy. If you look too serious, they're gonna run away. Okay. This is, <laughs> this is our classroom. <laughs> yeah. I think somewhere uh, learning this new stuff is important. The subject or whatever you want to call it is important, but how the learning happens is, is probably even more important. And I think the question is, how do we move from this stop, start, stop, start, stop, start during the day to a flow? How can we make learning a river? Okay, I'm getting a little romantic about this, but I just love uh, this whole river thing, right? How can we make it a river? Uh, there are banks and it holds the water in process. There is order, but there's also flow. There's resistance, but there's also a managing of that resistance. There are rocks there that are preventing something from flowing, but the water finds its way. Now how do we create that kind of space in our classrooms? Because then the river will flow by itself. It doesn't need somebody to push the water. So that's just a metaphor to begin with. Here, are, uh, before we take a break, here are two principles that I want to talk about because the rest of it is really a story where I tell the story and the principles are kind of uh, are built around that. This concept was, uh, was the brainchild of this guy called Carl Ronke. Um, one of my gurus, my mentor, I, I, I wouldn't call him a mentor because uh, we didn't get much time together. He's still alive, but he's much older. But if you can get any of his books, he's an incredible dude. Um, a lot of, so he taught me how to play. He taught me the importance of play in any learning environment. I remember when I started doing corporate work in, uh, in the mid 90s, some of my uh, peers would say, how, how do you, I mean, what is all this horsing around that you do with them? Uh, how do you do it? And I said, I don't know, it just, uh, I, I got this guru and uh, he showed me how people love to play. And all we've got to do is to get some playfulness into that space and do it early. And something completely different begins to happen. So if you, any of you want to learn the art of play, you can check in with people who run this thing called Play for Peace. Some of you have probably heard about it. And uh, you can learn how to play and make... Uh, make the most unplayful people, the most serious looking people laugh and jump around and uh, break a leg or whatever. So it comes from the organization he was working with at that point in time in the early 70s called Project Adventure. They still exist. They're doing some remarkable work. They've done some incredible work in the classroom to bringing adventure into the classroom. Okay, four elements. Okay, and let's see how we put this together. Members are invited to participate voluntarily, voluntarily in each of the various activities and challenges. And you know what, this is a really important principle. So um, we'll go through the text and then I'm gonna tell you a story and, and tell you where it is not valid because um, I've been do, I've trying to practice this for as many years as I've been in the field and the nature of it keeps changing and it's just incredible. So a member may choose to sit out an activity and this right is to be respected by others in the group and by the instructors. 
So if a child doesn't want to do anything, it's okay. And it recognizes that individuals potentially stand to learn and grow more by refusing to participate on occasions than unthinkingly and or resentfully always participating. So, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to tell you a story of where uh, challenge by choice is not applicable. Here's what I, here's a story that somebody told me. They said, this is a bunch of 12th graders. They just finished 12th grade, which is what, uh, 18 plus. And they're all chosen as a group, a group of 10 people chosen to go and do a seven day trek. And they joined an organization that was doing that kind of stuff. They landed up at the campsite. And they were all excited about it. They packed their bags, uh, loaded food, um, first aid, blah, blah, blah. I won't go into the details. Now, uh, there's one. OK, so they take off. Day one, post lunch. One of the kids decides he's had enough. He's struggling, he's really struggling. He's way behind, I would like some. He was way behind everybody else. There's one instructor with him, one instructor with the rest of the group. Now the gap is increasing. They were gonna uh, spend the night at a particular place. And this kid was, he just wasn't there. Post lunch, the instructor carries his bag. This guy finally struggles to the top. He's finished. He's just tired. He's given up. He's, he, he doesn't want to do it anymore. And um, now, what would you do? You remember, it's, uh, it's a circuitous route. So they start from one place and go around and come back. What would you do? I want some quick ones. Anybody? All you outdoor educators, what would you do? It depends on how much of the distance have we covered. If we are nearly there halfway. It's day one. Back, and day one or six days. Probably get uh, all the participants together, Got all them. the other children together, and yeah. uh, okay, so this is what is the situation. So, how can everybody, uh, you know, like get everybody to somehow like contribute in suggestions or opinions on how do we do this? Hey, listen, you know what? I really want to do that trick. I'm not going to wait for this guy, I'm mm. one of the participants, okay? Okay. Okay, here's the answer. As instructors, they failed. And the reason they failed was that they did not bring up the possibility of somebody, you know, on that day, it was this guy who was, you know, who had never done exercise, he was a little heavy. Um, his backpack was heavy, he'd never trekked before on that day. But you could easily have a twisted ankle and the scenario would be the same. What the instructors did not do was have that conversation while they were at the camp. Now, it would be completely unfair to gather them and, and choose to transfer responsibility to the group because you didn't prepare them for it. Does this make sense? Yeah. yeah. There was no previous design with the group. Absolutely. So in any work you do, this is a really critical piece and it needs to be done in the beginning. You can't pull challenge by choice and say, 
okay so we have the uh, you know whatever so i'll give you another example of challenge by choice um let's say you're doing a <clears throat> you're climbing a wall okay do you want a classroom example now here's the choice we're going to study a topic and we're going to study it for the next one week at the end of that week we're going to write an exam okay what i'd like you to do i'm setting up challenge by choice here okay what i'd like you to do is to have a look in small groups at the content and tell me how long you think it will take for you to learn this okay now i'm setting them up for decision making planning preparation getting ready for it and everything i might have said a week but that in my head is completely irrelevant i may not even say a week i'll just say okay here's the content how long do you think we will take to learn this okay let's say uh, can some of you be students and just respond how long do you think it will take and you just take any random thing okay doesn't matter what it is one anybody day. gauri one day one day okay so uh, are you saying that by the end of the day this whole class will know the content uh i don't know if <laughs> the whole class will know are the there content. any other students in the classroom there or is that only gauri's voice anybody yes then you got to put your mic off on sorry anybody else while she figures out her mic <laughs> Three days. Three days. Okay. Anybody else? I'd say five days. Okay, five. It would depend on my group. Sorry. It would depend on my group. I'm asking you. You are your group. Hmm. Probably five days. Okay. Let's just make some assumption. Okay. Uh, and then I go through the conversation. Then I ask you to go back. then i get these groups to talk to each other and say okay how long will we take let's say you you talk and you come to what number will you would you like four days nice four days na tera na mera not yours and mine but okay so four days my next question and this is all in that direction of challenge by choice um what if we cannot finish it in four days what if uh, some of us don't feel prepared for that test let's keep it 5 days uh, like what if you can't if you if at the end of 5 days you don't feel happy about it the people who have gotten it can help the other ones out and uh, will you do that on the fifth day so no during yeah. throughout you have throughout. to do it throughout nice see you're also already establishing protocol Also, and you are doing it i'm not suggesting it okay so here's what i'm hearing you are going to make groups so that those who can do it will help those who are struggling with it is that what i'm hearing yes okay also maybe uh, plan for a check in after 2 days okay. and then see if we need more time nice who's going to call the check in as a group i decide to meet there is no such see here's where you got to remember there's this group think now you got to nail it so here's me nailing it now who is the group who is we who is going to call it so you I have to give them ownership so basically they are oh, owning no, it no, 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 no. do it you see here's the thing we know about ownership we don't know how to do it yeah of course i'm giving you ownership but you've got to take it i can't give it to you 
this is not about me this is about you i can't give you ownership no what i mean is if if they're going to do an activity there has to be a space probably where we question okay how do you guys right? no sheena sheena where sheena, no, sheena. sheena. yes be a, be the student yeah okay because i know the principles and we we all know that we know the principles but we don't seem to practice be the student okay bully me um uh, i got cut in a bit so when i got disconnected it was at a point where we had to be the student and say what how how we can finish it or our duration right that's what we that's agreed what, to four days yeah we agreed to helping each other yeah my question is what ha- uh, how will we know whether we are ready for the test and uh, gauri said we going to check in after two days uh oh you missed mm, yeah <laughs> okay okay do you see what i'm doing here yeah i'm not saying okay you take ownership i will not use that language i will bring it to a place where the principles of chance by choice are being practiced let's say after the second day they turn around and say no sir this is too much we want to reduce the chapters number of pages i said great no problem so what do you want to reduce it to and for how long and i'm constantly going back to those four pieces and keeping the invitation open what does that mean they have the freedom to join voluntarily second people are going to sit out and i on the second day they'll say we didn't agree everybody else agreed but we didn't agree i say who is we and there'll be a whole bunch of kids who are struggling with it and then they say four of us said, okay so let's do one thing let's go back to the drawing table and we go through what we this cycle constantly going back to the intention the intention that we are there together which is for that period of time the chapter that needs to be completed are you getting this you have the freedom not to finish the chapter as well then you have choice and that choice is also critical the choice is about almost everything okay so if you have gone through this in the beginning and set them up for dialogue then you set them up for success okay anything you want to say or ask before we take a break i have a question about this vishwas from a parenting perspective yeah right uh, so it's a group and this is something that i do with my son i've done with my older boys too as in like a design when they agree to do something how are we going to do it how are they going to do it what happens where they are exploring what happens then they don't finish it or what's going on you know where it's come about but then again as a parent and i'm sure as teachers we i do have an agenda that i do want them to finish it or i do want them to hold where where does accountability come in like not to finishing something accountability for something uh they have agreed and then they don't or, or is that also a learning experience then can i just throw that back okay what are you accountable to i am accountable to you see the problem is we get we get hung up with that agenda i am okay. accountable to getting my agenda fulfilled hmm now the game is over and here's the thing we tend to look at all things that need to be completed in that frame of time my children they're 20 and 
they still don't fold their clothes. <laughs> this, I, I, I should turn this camera. You know, you uh, last time you said, "Oh, such a beautiful view, two windows." Oh, there's my son. He's folding his clothes right now. <laughs> if I turn the camera a little this way, you'd see what a mess it is. And you're now, okay with that? Now here's, uh, ha, ha, yeah. So here's the thing. I have. I have to constantly learn to park what I want in that parking lot and say, what am I okay with? I am actually okay with their room stinking to high heaven till they recognize that it needs to be done. And this is what I discovered. They also have a cycle of messiness. Even they can't stand it at some point in time and they come alive to it. It's just that my cycle is different from theirs. And uh, there's some lessons that we never learn that our parents try to teach us. But there's a whole lot out there that they're learning that, uh, uh, damn, I wish I was their age sometimes. Because they're so good at it. And I say, how, how do they figure that one out? I wish I could. Does that make sense? And I think somewhere we've got to come to this place where we can see our children as our educators. And if we can do that, then I think this whole power balances out a little. Unfortunately, in most educational scenarios as a teacher, I'm supposed to know everything. I didn't know a thing about geography when I taught, went and went to teach it in seventh grade. Didn't know a thing. I walked in and we learned together. It was fabulous. I almost got thrown out. The kids loved it. They're still in touch. The, so here's, here's the point. The principle of challenge by choice is immensely powerful. But we have to have that patience and we have to know that we have no control over that inner world. And most of our pain as partners, as teachers, as parents, as bosses, as subordinates comes from that. Go take a break for five minutes. See you back soon. Are you having fun yet or are you going to sleep? There's a lot to cover today. I'm not letting you go. And those who want to go can go. You know how it works, right? You can get angry at me. You are teachers. I have only one chance with you. I'm not going to say it again. Of course, I'm going to say it again. I'm just going to give you as much as I can. Go have a cup of coffee and come. Cheers. Uh, Vish I'm here if you want me. Uh, Vishwas, I am suddenly losing the screen. I'm not able to see myself and I'm, mm. I'm seeing you and a whole lot of things. Then uh, that is life. Suddenly we lose sight of ourselves. <laughs> uh, tell me how do I get back the original screen and... Uh, okay. Oh, I can see you now. Uh, I can see Chetan fully, but I can't see myself. Uh, oh. Where is that small thing that comes, you know, like a box? Yeah, you have no idea how wisely you speak. <laughs> <laughs> that is life. We're constantly seeing somebody else, not us. <laughs> I am frustrated now. <laughs> And I, I am I have to leave early also today. More wisdom comes from you. <laughs> uh, Chetan, can you help me please? Yeah, so uh, towards the top of your screen, there yeah. must be a thing called speaker view or grid view. Top of the screen. It's yeah. all either like nine dots like a square. Oh. You might have to move your cursor to see it. Um, I have a square and I have another rectangle with a small square in us. Yeah, yeah. So what click the small squares. Uh, 
No, it's just a large square, uh, you know, with four corners. So if you click I that, you go full screen. You don't want that. What's next to that? Uh, oh, now that has disappeared. Uh, then, you know what? What? <laughs> what is it? Can you see me? Can you see my screen? You, I can see you. I can see you full. Can you see my screen? Uh, sorry? Can you see what the challenge by choice screen? No. Fine. Uh, okay. Okay. There is something on a small screen. Yeah. It is too tiny for me yeah, to I'm see. Bigger than challenge by choice? Yes. Yes. I think I can read that. Huh? Okay. So now what? Now there's a vertical slider, the divider. Between those two, is there a divider? Just take your, take the mouse there. A divider in that challenge by choice? Yeah, you see two windows, right? You have challenge by choice and you have me, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Between huh. you see. There is no divider. There is just a small box challenge by choice in the corner. When you when you hover your mouse in between the challenge by choice screen and Vishwas, there will be a line that will come. If you drag that line, you can increase or decrease the size of either of them. I can't see that. It's not coming. Okay. We've got three minutes. Can you make her co-host and... <laughs> make her co-host and... <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Let me try that. Let me try that. That is your challenge, Vishwas, to get me to do these things. Then can you... Uh, one sec. Do you think she has pinned the video? Yeah. She probably pinned someone's it, video. Somebody else who's come on the screen. Divya. Hmm. Ah, she's on that. Whoever she's on loves. speaker view. So whoever speaks will come on the screen. Yeah. So how do I get into the major screen? Then do you see a recording? Like something now, right now, I've got challenge by choice covering my screen and a small no, no, window. Don't worry. Okay, so so it's good. You have challenge by choice covering the whole screen, huh. and in the small window, actually, uh -huh. if you uh -huh. look towards the corner of the window and if you pull it down, you will see everybody. If I pull it down, yeah. If you just you know pull down the window from the down, right, it, it it goes down, but nobody comes on the screen. Okay, so what about the top bar of so that small view, window? Can I, it shows. Yeah. Grid view, you will see everybody. And then there are two show thumbnail video. Okay. Ah. I got you all. <laughs> I, <laughs> but I can't remember how I'm doing this. <laughs> no. Okay. Vishwas, I have a quick question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Vishwas, um, where can I read up more about uh, challenge by choice? Say that again. Where can I explore more about challenge by choice? The funny thing is, oh, I have already put articles in the folder. Okay. Uh, I, I, yes, okay. Okay? Yeah. Great. Can we move? Here we go. The next one, very important. And this is about us. Can I see you again? Or? Okay, here we go. The other principle that is really it's called invitational education. Here's my question Have you ever met anybody who is not motivated? Yes. Tell me more. How do you know? So there was this one point of time when I was with a group of students and we were to leave for a game of, I think, uh, volleyball. And this girl, she said that she was not interested to play. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she just said no in so one go. Does that mean she was not motivated? Uh, she because we because one of the instructors went on telling her that uh, uh, why don't you come along and just be there for some time if you feel like participating then you can join in and if you do not then it's all right so she said that 
Well, I really don't want to go. Anushree, answer my question. What was the question? Does that mean she was not motivated? Or do you want to refine that statement again? Can I can we say that she was not motivated to play volleyball? Yes, she was not motivated to play. Did you ask her what she was motivated about? Yes, yes. What? She wanted to uh, sketch. She was motivated. She was motivated to sketch, but not to play. So how can you say she was not motivated? <laughs> yeah. well, I thought maybe in that context. Ah. <laughs> That is the problem. We want them to be motivated about the thing that we are teaching. I want you to be motivated about a clean challenge. No, I don't. <laughs> you can be motivated by whatever you want. Okay, so here's the principle. I, I want you to pay attention to this because this is really critical. There is no such thing as somebody not being motivated. Everybody is motivated. We just motivated about different things. So here's what the principle assumes. Anybody want to argue that now? Shake your heads nicely so I know you've understood. Nice. Okay. She, she was choosing her behavior, right? And the behavior that she was choosing was because she wanted to stay safe. Volleyball was a threat to her in some way. And it may not have been volleyball, it could be group dynamics in volleyball. It could be some friend she had a fight with. We don't know. But when we, when you see somebody who is not, who you think is not motivated, know that they are motivated, but they're choosing their behavior in the context of the thing that you are motivated about. And they're choosing that behavior because they want to stay safe. Clear? Okay. So, there are four pieces to this. Remember, this is for us. We have to stay optimistic. What does that mean? So I'm just going to keep using Anushree's example of volleyball, right? That she possibly would be a great volleyball player. I don't know today, but it's waiting to be discovered. Yeah? And my job as an educator is to invite it forth. How so? <laughs> yeah, Sheena, did you figure that one out? Okay, here it is. Um, all of us have been have joined the place afresh, and were called a new teacher in that environment. Yes. You know, yes. all schools have a culture. They have an environment. And we walk into that space and we don't know it. And if we are the affable, lovable, reaching out type of people, then with, by the end of the day, you've got children all around you. Yes? We've all encountered teachers in our, when we were children that we just wanted to hang around them. I remember, I remember one teacher in, in, uh, in my school 
and she came into my life uh, she must have been 20 something just finished graduation and uh, she was the house mother and she used to climb walls with us i just remember how much i loved her i was probably 7 years old then i've never forgotten her because there was something she did in those few months that she was the house mother it just completely affected me so deeply that i will never forget it and what she was doing was against the law teachers don't climb walls especially not in saris oh god and poor thing you know I can, I can, I think back and I say, I think she had to leave because she was just too friendly with the children. That's what they call them. And that's tragic. So what she did was create and invite. Now, do you understand that? She was inviting in a disinviting environment. Clear? Better? Cool. Remember I said the groan is the most beautiful sound I've heard in a classroom when I walk in? Oh. That's what it means. Here's an opportunity. It's okay to say no and to be able to respect it. And you see, the problem with us now as adults, as parents, is that we've got this strange belief in our heads that if he says no today, he's going to say no tomorrow and every day. Strange. Ask yourself the things that you have said no to. On a particular day, did that no remain the same for the rest of your life till now? No to bone vita, no to milk, no to green vegetable. Come on. I mean, the very things that you said constantly no to to your parents, you're probably doing with joy today. What happened? Just a different clock. But most times as an educator i want my classroom and my students and my children to run by my clock problem so if we can so remember that today they may say no hey ask the question again tomorrow would you like to have some green vegetables or whatever whatever that really hard question is for that person just because they say no doesn't mean I have to stuff it down their throats, nor does it mean that I've got to stop asking. Oops. Here's a question. Have you ever received an invitation and said no? Yes. Have you received it again after that? No. Strange, you know how you remember that invitation? If you didn't if you didn't take the invitation, it makes sense that you would forget about it because it was not important or whatever. But you remember the invitation. So here's what we need to remember, that that invitation is an opportunity to build trust. And what does it mean to trust the process? 
it means that I will invite. I invite you today. You said no. I'm going to invite tomorrow. You might say no. I'm going to invite you day after, and you might say no, and that's fine. I'm not going to be hurt by it or affected by it. I'm just going to keep inviting. Because part of that process is the decision of doing something coming from the person. Just as you remember that one invitation you said no to and you never, you see, they haven't done this course, so they don't know about repeated invitations. But people whom you are inviting into a particular space, please remember, just because they say no does not mean that they do not remember the invitation. So be joyful and say, hey, would you like to learn mathematics today? It's okay for them to say no. Maybe change your question. Would you like to count money today? Have you tried that with some kids? They just love counting money. They're doing math. Okay, so an invitation from my own life. I'd gone to the US to attend that AE conference and stuff like that. And, and uh, the friend I was staying with, he said, hey, do you want to go kayaking? I said, yeah, sure. He said, um, so we took, take this drive from Chicago and we go towards, uh, I don't know, towards the Mississippi, okay? And then we land up at my, at the, pers uh, at the person's house that I've idolized all my life, the same guy I mentioned, Carl Ronke. So we go to his house and I'm, I'm like that, you know, I just met Shah Rukh Khan kind of thing. Of course, I'm much older, so I'm a, lo a lot quieter. I'm not jumping around. And here was the opportunity of going kayaking with my my idol? Is that what we call it? Did I get that right? Okay. So here's the opportunity. Anyway, we go kayaking in the Mississippi River. We go down river and, and there's this... I tell it very hilariously now. But for the four hours that we were on the river, it was the most tortuous experience I've ever had. And it wasn't the kayaking. It was just that I cursed myself for never kayaking before because this friend of mine and Carl are exactly about 50 feet ahead of me and they're having this wonderful conversation that I can just about hear. And I'm trying my furious best to get there. And no matter how hard I try, that gap remains at 50 feet. It was the most frustrating three and a half hours I've ever had. Now, the question is this, it was an invitation, but I'm guessing the nature of the invitation will change the next time. I took it. I valued it. I took it for what it was then. If I was invited again, would I go? Would I look forward to three and a half hours of suffering? But there was something in that whole experience and it was, I need, I need to trust the process that the invitation will come and the opportunity will be created. I'm looking at it from the student's point of view also, right? That I got an invitation, I took it, I struggled through it. I'd go again, 
I go through the same suffering sometimes. And maybe even say, okay, something changes in the internal world that they have no control over, but it's changing for me. So when we invite our students into that space, something in their world also changes. So keep those invitations going because I tell you what, they're not being forgotten. Even your worst enemy won't forget your inv invitation. Okay, it's hugely intentional, no accidents. If you remember Kung Fu Panda, there are no accidents. You remember that? Okay. You ready? So here's a choice. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's me. I, I, I'm sure it is. But we are kind of lagging in my opinion about the content being covered. But if it's still being valuable to you, then we can uh, what I think you need to make a choice today about is pace. Is it too slow content wise? Uh, are you getting enough? So I'd like to hear some voices about how, it, how things are going because I'm a little, um, I, I need your participation in this because uh, let's say I have 20 minutes, I have a choice. We can either do an activity, the tangram thing, or we can uh, do something really important. Uh, the pace is fine, Vishwas. I don't think there's any issue. Okay. And I think by more of your sharing, some of the concepts are becoming clearer. Okay. So I think the I'm just concerned that those of us who are not used to sitting for long periods of time like this and sometimes need an activity, um, I don't know. How's it going? <coughs> we do have only I eight sessions. I just, yeah, sorry. I feel the pace is nice because if it goes a little faster than this, uh, it will be a little difficult on a personal note to grasp everything, but uh, it really seems well paced. It really helps to seep in everything what's coming in. Okay. Even I feel that the pace is fine, absolutely fine, Vishwas. But one thing that I would like to say and suggest, if we can have like two or three breaks in between, like a three minute break or a two minute break, like a quick washroom break, something like that, that will really help us, you know, move around and get back together, get focused again. Just a suggestion. Cool. Do you want one now? No, I just came back. <laughs> oh. I'm feeling happy. Yeah. Anybody, anybody? Yeah, but I, I, I did miss something in the start. So I just feel that, you know, if it was more often, then there'd be less missing. Got it. I will remember that. Any naysayers? Okay. So that I'm just going to move. And the next thing, uh, the next thing we're going to do is going to be built around the story. So I'm going to tell you a story. And as the story builds, the model builds. You ready? Yeah. So we know this, right? So instead of focusing on what we do not have control over, let's look at what we have control over. <clears throat> okay. Simple enough. So I was invited to take 11th graders of a co-ed uh, elite school for a five day camp. This was years ago. Um, 
And so here, here are the things I was paying attention to. And as I build the model, I'm going to uh, tell you what it was. And these are the elements that affect all our lives, but we do not pay enough attention to them because uh, we make a lot of assumptions about uh, a lot of things. So there are five pieces to this. So the reason for gathering was um, they said that, you know, this is 11th grade, they've come from different schools and we'd like them to get to know each other. Uh, also, they, they, uh, there's a lot of subgrouping and there's a lot of, they're fighting with each other, they don't get along, blah, blah, blah. And um, so we'd like you to take these guys out for five days and uh, pay attention to the following things. One is we want them to build a sense of community that they belong to that group and that school and that uh, class and so on and so forth. So we want them to work together, gel or bond as they called it. We want them to start helping and stop fighting. Uh, we want them to learn something about decision making because in the next year they're going to have to make some big decisions about their life. And this is a wonderful opportunity also for them to explore this topic called leadership. So great. Now, here are the things that dropped into my head. What do they want? And this is what they wanted. Okay, I just stated it to you. I need to know why I'm choosing to do this. And my reasons for that were that I, uh, I like working with young people and I love the outdoors, I love the exertion, I, I love the uncertainty, the, uh, uh, you, you think you know a lot and suddenly uh, it comes and slaps you in the face and you have to respond immediately and there's certain of the unknown which is really exciting about the outdoors. That was my purpose. I needed to define what a successful delivery would look like. Um, so what do we, uh, so I had to imagine what it would look like at the end of five days. And the only thing I could see at that point in time was a bunch of young people, I think there were 20 of them, who were getting along, smiles, laughter, uh, being able to resolve conflict, being able to create conflict and then resolve it. Because at that age, there's so much uh, that's conflicting in the world. Now I've got to design a plan that matches that need and I've got to ask myself, does my plan match their need? So what I decided was that I would take them to a campsite, which was on the river, Kaveri. I was in Bangalore then. And um, this was a campsite which had, uh, which was a tented accommodation, no electricity, uh fairly simple great food um lots of creepy crawlies and even the occasional elephant walking into the campsite and bears beautiful place uh, i chose that now that's my adventurous self wanting that to happen and um, it also offered opportunities for water activity mountain activity treks rock climbing so everything that I wanted them to go through in terms of experiences, that campsite offered. Great. So um, now when you look at this later, I want you to, uh, the questions still are good, okay? Whether you're in a classroom or you're doing an outdoor adventure and stuff, the questions are still valid. Uh, if you are a teacher in a class teaching what geography, physics, chemistry, whatever, these are still valid. Okay. I needed to know more, more about my audience. These were, these were 11th graders, co-ed, uh, rich families. Um, impressionable, wanting to make an impression on others. Uh, they lived fairly comfortable lives. Most of their needs were taken care of. They were dropped to, uh, to school in cars, most of them. Most of their decisions about their life was being made by their parents and their teachers. 
uh, and they really expected everything to come their way instead of them having to do much. Okay. Uh, they were energetic, playful, and fairly physically fit. Most of them played some kind of a sport. Now, I didn't know what they wanted. So I had, I had an idea. So I walked into that classroom a month before the program and I said, okay, so we're going out for five days. What do you want to do? And they gave me a whole bunch of things as young people will do. And um, most of it matched what I was able to deliver. And uh, so I said, so what does it mean for you? Uh, how are you going to have a great experience? So some of them started uh, doing more exercise and physically preparing themselves. Some of them uh, started getting their equipment in place, backpack, shoes, you know how it works, right? It's like a big thing. It's a five day uh, part of their uh, school curriculum. And uh, they started preparation, but I, I had to get to that place where I went to that conversation, the principles of challenge, by choice were presented to them and the process really began at that point in time uh, in that relationship with them so I was setting them up for them taking charge of a lot of the things that needed to be done okay here's my take on classroom education I personally in through my own experience have found that children do not need teachers they have the ability to learn what we think, what, uh, what we think they need to learn. We just have to get them to that place where they discover that. Unfortunately, we take charge of content, process, correction, oh man, and then we just make our lives really miserable. In that year that I went back to teaching in school, I was able to be the most chilled teacher in the whole school because I gave everything away to the children. And the thing is, they did a damn good job. They did a far better job than me. Because a teacher is by and large pretty biased. Okay? So, I was setting them up for success. That's what I wanted to say. Big question, will I be able to manage them? So the norms about being in the outdoors in that electricity less place, 11th graders, you know, all kinds of things can happen. And so boys can't go to girls' tents, girls can't go to boys' tents, all that. There were, there were some things that I had to set boundaries for, and that was not negotiable, but they also were as simple as possible. So setting boundaries, setting norms, and getting... So there's some things that we set, but we want to make it as, you know, it's really about their physical, social, emotional, and uh, intellectual safety. We're looking at it from that point of view, not because I can't handle it. Okay? So I really needed to question, okay, what am I able to manage and not manage? How should I prepare myself for them? Uh, live challenged by choice and live invitational education. So if they chose not to do something, it was okay. But just because they chose not to do something does not mean that I have to keep them entertained in ways that they wanted to be entertained. We've got to be able to separate that. I needed to be mindful that these were young, impressionable people potentially very quickly emotionally uh, hurt. Um, looked at elders pretty much as, uh, um, as barriers to being able to fulfill their own desires. And while that might be true, and I, while I wanted to, I didn't want them to be physically unsafe, I needed to be careful that I didn't use the word no and don't too often. The setting is important. Where am I? Am I in the classroom? Am I in the outdoors, top of a mountain, uh, in 
the swimming pool. I don't know. Education happens in so many different places. I also needed to know what I could do using that place as base camp. So we had, uh, we were choosing to have a night out. We were choosing to do a lot of, um, you know, uh, high uh, perceived risk, uh, you know, activities like hanging off wires and rappelling and stuff like that. So activities at heights. Okay, so here's the story. So the activity was essentially this. There would be somebody harnessed, that branch was 40 feet above the ground, and there was a rope that went through various gadgets. And uh, so each child, one at a time, was harnessed. And then uh, you see the yellow line. Yeah, so the group is holding the rope. And when I say go, the group starts moving back and the person who's harnessed starts running forward. So you have that pendulum movement and they're going up. It can be scary as hell. Remember it's 40 feet, that's four floors. Huge opportunity for learning about trust, acceptance, uh, relationships, physical ability, emotional stretch, all kinds of things. So there was this girl, so we started the activity, there was this one girl who stayed 40 feet away from the activity on the ground. She didn't want to come anywhere close. It was very, very clear that she was anxious. So, and I, I, I didn't want to push it. Here is me at that point in time, practicing challenge by choice, that she has more to gain by standing there and watching than me pushing her into it. Uh, every two people that did the activity, I would ask her, oh, would you like to go? By the time half the group had gone through, uh, she, it seemed like she was receptive. And then I said, hey, look, you know, I don't have to do it. Just wear a harness and you can stand there if you want. So by the time she wore the harness, she came about 20 feet away from the activity space. And she stayed there and uh, she kept watching. Two kids later, I said, uh, do you want to come closer? Do you want to have a look? And she came a little closer. Uh, then I said, um, do you want to do it? She said, yes, but I don't want to be pulled up. I said, okay, no problem. So I'll just hook you in. And you can stand there. And just remember, you have nothing to prove to anybody. You just go as far as you want. So she came up close, got hooked in, and now she's breathing hard because now she's part of the system. Okay? And she's, I'm not sure whether she was crying or laughing. And I, and I said, uh, you know what? You don't have to do it. But if you want to do it, let me know. She hung in there for about 10 minutes, got her breath back. Now, I had to deal with the rest of the kids as well, right? They're holding that rope and they, they've pulled about 15 kids up and they know what it feels like and how much fun it is or whatever, or scary it is, whatever. And I said, you will not move an inch till I tell you. And I, I had uh, my colleagues handle that end of it. Because here was a case where she was, my invitations were getting her to build trust in the process. Anyway, then she said, okay, just a little. Can you just pull me, kind of, uh, lift me four inches off the ground? I said, sure. And we got the group very respectfully to lift her off the ground. She's breathing heavier now. She's crying. She's laughing. She's enjoying it. She's scared as hell. I said, do you want a little more? I said, you decide. She said, a little more, please. And they pulled a little back. And they pulled a little more. And they pulled a little more. And by the end of it, that's her, 40 feet high. Okay, so what's the point I'm making here? 
here what she by, by me practicing invitational education and challenge by choice this is what she was able to do for herself she recognized that she had choice she need not have done it she knew that and she had ample opportunity to say no but she made a choice she needed to be in a state where she felt like she was in control with her the decisions that she was making and a feeling of control comes from here and here it's not that physical 10 feet above the ground thing it's that i can control my destiny even though i'm a mess emotionally i'm still in control we felt this in our lives right she made the decisions about where she wanted to get to okay um and that get to could have meant 4 inches 4 feet or 40 feet she had, she was the one who was in control but she was there were there were external pieces influencing time boundary there was only a certain amount of time and she had to make those choices and and that pressure was created internally not by me the setting she was watching her colleagues she was watching the process she was watching the equipment she was watching everything and she and she was making the decisions based on that but it was her making sense and meaning of it she was also obviously affected by the people around and one of the things i usually do in the work that i do especially in the adventure field is uh, is try and prevent the audience from making noise an example of that is uh, you're climbing the wall and everybody is saying oh come on you can do it blah blah blue blue you know whatever else and there you are struggling on that wall you can't hear a thing and everybody else is screaming and shouting and if you make it you're a success if you don't make it you're a success who cares what that means but for that period of time a lot of people become dependent on that noise and that in my opinion takes away from that personal experience if somebody wants screaming and shouting they've got to ask for it the choice must be theirs not somebody else's i mean how many times have you seen people do something remarkable and then blame the group and say if it wasn't for your encouragement i would never be able to do it what a waste man don't blame me for your you know why are you doing that she knew what was involved okay she did a hell of a lot for herself and every once in a while they will if we can play out these two principles of challenge by choice and invitational education well i'm telling you you'll have remarkable and this is classroom as well so don't look at that and say oh that was ropes and tricks no it wasn't when i did the geography class they made they decided how much they wanted to learn and you know what they learned 11th grade geography without knowing it because they were not limited by the textbook we threw the textbook away i said we got to learn the physical I'm, we're going to do this later so i won't tell you the whole story okay two other elements be prepared for it if you are teaching 7th grade geography no uh 12th grade geography we have to have more knowledge than you know uh, it's described as teaching at the edge of your ability and what that means is this if you're a 7th grade geography teacher 
you will learn only that much and you will teach only that much the moment somebody says okay you know what next year you're going to teach eighth grade geography you go oh, well i've never taught eighth grade i know you're an msc you're a masters in geography you can't teach eighth grade geography it's in the head so just the ability we got to know more we we'll never know if we know more just remember that but we've got to at least know more than what needs to be covered i know i know guys i just got a reminder from my son saying it's 7:30 last 10 minutes i don't know if we will ever reach a course in which i can cover some of this but this is the biggest piece in the entire thing who was that person who showed up that day and was able to do what i did to that person if i had my outcomes in mind would i be able to do that did i understand her situation how often have we walked into a classroom in a in a disturbed emotional state and affected everything else and everybody else in that state and don't think you didn't because you did you just don't know it so maybe maybe sometime in jan feb i might do something on uh, self facilitation and that's that part that how do we deal with ourselves in the context of what we do okay so obvious thank you for making that decision about whether to cover content or the activity so here's what we can do we will start the active we will start the next session with an activity okay great uh anything you want to say before we close the mic is yours uh vishwas what we just did right now yeah is objectives or uh, setting resources educator are those the five p's that are mentioned in the literature that you have uh, posted in the material ah uh, this is i think my model i i haven't found it in a book yet okay so i haven't written any text on it uh but that's that's the sense of it okay okay, okay. yeah uh so is the uh, so uh, the other one is colin beard's model which i've given you enough text about and if you feel like having a conversation with colin beard i can share with him he he's extremely helpful he's been to india a couple of times i've worked with him a uh, wonderful chap and he's more than willing to uh, uh, have a dialogue with you if you're interested he's active on facebook those who need to leave you know what you do, have to do it you know get lost and get found but i'm here if anybody wants has a question yes yeah, so uh, vishwas Yeah. I just uh, wanted to share uh, when you were talking about the settings. I just had uh, you know flashback of uh, one of the outdoor trip which I took. It was to uh, Bhutan, and we had this ten uh, kilometer uphill trek. And I uh, I have little wobbly knees, and uh, whatever you said made so much of sense because. Uh, the instructor actually had planned beforehand and uh, there was a plan that in case you know i deter and i could not you know complete the trek and uh, i reached midway and what happened is uh, i slipped and i fell down there were these uh, horses coming in and uh, you know i just panicked and uh, and i fell down there so Mangi, now that when you were face? telling can i see sorry? you can i see your face yeah yeah okay okay i might get little emotional because that's what 
I have a few tears, no problem. Okay, yeah, because okay, it's okay. so vivid in my mind, and I just totally related with that. And uh, so I slipped and I fell down, and at that point of time, I felt that I I have lost it. I cannot do this, you know. I beyond. have to commit suicide. I've got to run away from life. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was I was basically really embarrassed because yeah. that place yeah. was chock a block with people. and i was like from head to toe covered in covered in grime and and there were like people and i always thought that it was my group's motivation which led me and i completed the trek to cut a long story short you know yeah so and till date i always give them the credit that you know only because of you i could uh, complete the trek but that now that you are telling talking about this it gives me a new perspective to think that yes it was my you know my willingness in the end i told myself that yes you could do it of course motivation helped me at that point of time but uh, yes and then my instructor i was really blessed to have those people with me they all stopped midway and then they were like all the time with me yeah but of course my willingness yeah 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 <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I still uh, want to give them the credit because that's what I've been always thinking. Yeah, no, so, that's what you've been taught. You're just doing it. Yeah. So, so find a new language. Please take credit for what you did because you did yeah. it. The only thing they could have done for you is taken you back. Yeah. Okay. So there's an article um, that I have posted called uh, I don't know something that I wrote about the story that I described. it goes into detail as to how challenge by choice cannot be applicable if you have not prepared your group for it okay i'll read that okay. yeah. thank you 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 know i told you get lost <laughs> yeah yeah i will find you next week yep bye bye but if there's anybody who wants to stay or ask i'm here Vishwas, um, one of the things that I was thinking about that uh, you know when uh, while using challenge uh, by choice and uh, say if some people in the group make a choice um, that also affects the rest of the group and you know so how do you like you know then keep that in mind while designing for um, you know designing for choice. um so i was when you were talking about this whole thing i was thinking about this particular experience where i was teaching um in a college and there were around 60 students um and this was a college for the development sector um on on the third day of my course is when the delhi violence broke out um and um, so while i was still on my way to college is when i saw the news and i enter the classroom and i suddenly sense that you know there are lots of people who would not want to be in the class and um, um so i started the class with that uh, and you know i said that i can totally understand if you want to go you, there are people in the classroom who are working with communities in delhi so you can go ahead but i think that changed not just but one it really opened up the class like there was a sudden shift in how uh i was in the class as well but at the same time i think it did something to the energy of the rest of the 30 people who still decided to stay um and and i think while i was um, and i hadn't like thought about it that much it was that time my intuition and what i would have expected my teacher to do and i just did that but um, i think later i kept thinking about what it did to the remaining 30 people um i think some of the conversations that we had um so some of the conversations that we had with those 30 people even later in our chai break and stuff was that you know their challenges in making that decision of whether they want to go they want to stay how engaged they could be in class so i was you know i was just i it took me back to that situation that when you design for choice and while some people make that choice how does it affect the rest of the group it always affects other people but the problem is we think that as educators we are going to be at the raw end of the stick 
<clears throat> but the truth is that if the choice, if you're giving them the choice, then the choice of how to resolve the differences must be theirs as well. <clears throat> and the pro they must learn the process to that also. Till then, nothing moves forward. Like the story I was telling you, under that bridge, I had that conversation, and it took us three hours to resolve it, but uh, uh, I said no lunch till, uh, till we resolve it. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I, I think that whole point of why they are not choosing to do something is also a choice and the responsibility lies with them. Quite sure. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it was, uh, hi. Yes, Asha. Sorry about uh, bad, <laughs> poor thing, too bad connectivity here. Uh, my question is not uh, really about. Uh, uh, anything which you thought today it was wonderful and enjoyed it. I just want to know from your experience, you have this field for very long. Uh, see, uh, yes, uh, telling that I can understand as teachers and you talk about it at school level, but uh, personally, uh, because I too have uh, grown up kids, I know as the, uh, you know, the students who are going to college, who are doing high education, who are, you know, the most uh, um, frustrated lot at many times, unhappy with the course they have joined because parents have asked them to and all that. So where does all this come in? This sort of, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, as an educator, our role there. What have you, I want uh, your experience about it because you're always you uh, youngsters, teenagers, higher education, I mean, students who are in engineering, who are in other fields and they realize they're in the wrong profession. Okay, rule number one for me, huh? you're asking me, so I'm going to, uh, Asha, can you hear me? Yeah, I want your experience. Yeah, uh, I think you went underwater. So uh, uh, I wanted what is your experience with this, uh, you know, this category of uh, students who are at a higher uh, in the universities, basically. Got it. So here's my answer. Rule number one, I'm not responsible for their pain. Okay. I'm not responsible for their dissatisfaction. Uh, I can't be responsible for their performance. The only thing I can take responsibility for and own is uh, whatever relationship I develop with them in the time that we are together. Mm -hmm. And I will invest in that. And I may not talk to them. So if somebody is doing masters in chemistry or BSc or whatever else, my job may not be to make them better chemists. My job is to make them better people. Eventually, nobody, you know, uh, only frugally are we measured by our degrees. In the end, we are measured by how we present ourselves and who we show and who we show up as when we meet other people. So I'm looking at it not from the dissatisfaction of doing a course that they don't want to be in at that point in time. I'm just taking that 30,000 foot view and saying, what does this person's life look like after they've finished this? With the experience, yeah. And I will, then, I will then build my relationship around that. But I'm... Have uh, any cities approached you? That you um, Asha, your voice is underwater. Universities. Sorry, have any universities approached me for what? Uh, for teaching this course? Yes. yes. No, it's I have for, uh, for spiritual education that providing. Yes. Thank God, no. <laughs> okay. And the reason is this: I'm doing okay. it because I want to do it. And the beautiful thing is the people you see here, 
are the people who want to do it. And if I go on to 7.30 and 8, they will tolerate me. Yes, Melvin, give me a minute. You see how you're tolerating me? You think those university students who come to do a course are going to tolerate me? No way. So, uh, and then there's too much other stuff. But here's my answer. If somebody asked me to do it, I would do it. But I would do it on my terms. I'm just waiting for somebody to ask me before I die. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes, Milan. Uh, we've been using uh, rappelling uh, to instill uh, or uh, to help uh, participants uh, cope with their fear, yeah. changing their fear. So, uh, you know, we, uh, after they have gone through it, we, we structure it. We, uh, yeah. It, we tell them about uh, the infrastructure, about the equipment, uh, about the um, you know level of the structures, and uh, and then uh, after everybody has done it, we ask them as to okay, why did you take that final step of uh, uh, from the point of no return? Mm -hmm. What motivated you to do that? And mm -hmm. then people are in, uh, motivated by the infrastructure, some by the level of competence of the instructor. Uh, you know, some by uh, then there are some who actually get motivated by the encouragement given to them by the team. So uh, I, I, I'm I'm fine. I mean uh, the motivation is his, but uh, isn't the team also uh, an ingredient for his motivation? Absolutely. Only. My question would be, who made the choice about encouraging and why? Does that make sense? So here's, here's a different scenario. Uh, you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same raffle. But you, you're telling the participants, hey, look, you know what? When somebody needs it, they will ask for it. Mm. There's a whole bunch of people who won't say this, but they just hate that. They don't like the noise because it's taking the experience away from them. They can't hear a thing or if at all, it's just noise. Yeah. For some and, yeah, yeah. And, and, but, but it's a hard thing to say in a social environment, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you can, if we can set it up so that people take ownership for the for their choices and their decisions, then we are handing the rope to them and saying, "Hey, you take charge of what works for you. Mm. Don't be don't become dependent or a victim no. okay. to group think and group behavior and social norms that may be completely ineffective and useless to you." Mm -hmm. So we first uh, established as to uh, you know, everyone finds out his or her own coping technique. And once uh, it comes out that some person uh, has a coping technique of drawing uh, motivation, motivation from others, they, they, this can be a, uh, you know, a feedback uh, that uh, you need not depend on others. <laughs> Melinda, I'm going to bully you on this one. <laughs> Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, so here's my here's my point. If you do that, then you're doing what we call critical analysis. Which means that you're critiquing their dependencies. And my question is, what's wrong with that? What's wrong if somebody depends on somebody else for encouragement? Yeah, that was my position to begin with. I know. But you, but you didn't set it up for that, see? When we set it up for that and we say, look, the issue is this. We're looking at the rappel not as a group activity. We're looking at mm. it as an individual journey. Yes, yes or no? Okay. Yes. Simple. Yeah. Then don't yeah. let the group thing affect that individual uh, experience unless they choose it. Mm. So if I want encouragement, I'm mm. going to shout to the group and say, guys, I want you to shout. Mm. 
then they've taken ownership for what they need. Hmm. They, they're making a choice. How fair is it for, and you also experienced the um, people who've gone down shivering and then you ask them, how was the experience? It would have not happened if it wasn't for the group. Hmm. Where is that personal experience gone? Hmm. That conversation to drag it back to that is one of the hardest things and then uh, it doesn't work. So hmm. I'm saying we need to set it up in a way that we present the activity as an individual experience. Right. And then mm. the conversation can be brought to a place where they see the connection between uh, screaming and shouting and performance mm. or encouragement as you call it or dependency or whatever. Yeah. That's fine. But we need to get them to a place where they bring it up, not be presented to them as something that may not be, because the moment we say it as facilitators, it becomes acceptable or not acceptable. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. 